Right. I, I guess we can probably start with a with a second um, part of of this morning's session. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, introducing our our colleague, uh, Dr. Eva Falaschi, from the Scuola Normale Superiore in uh, in Pisa, uh, where she has been a research fellow since 2014. If if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, it, it's hard to do justice actually um, in 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 a, just a few words to to the range. Uh, and depth of, of Eva's research uh, interests. Um, she has worked and, and published broadly on, uh, well, on ancient art, but most specifically, I think, uh, you won't mind me saying, on ancient artists, really, right? And, and, and indeed on, uh, on, on the reception uh, of, of Greek art and artists, uh, especially in uh, the imperial uh, period, um, on ancient art critics as well on ancient uh, treatises on on art and artistic um, theories um, her phd uh, which was defended in 2015 at the scuola normale is a is a major study um, and after all she, i mean she's got a she's got a um, thorough philological uh, training uh, she she actually has quite a lot of uh, uh, work in the pipeline on uh, um, on scoliasts, on ancient scoliasts, and indeed on, on Lush, and so there's... Um, and over the last few years, uh, a major focus of her research uh, has been uh, a uh, collaborative uh, project on uh, Book 35 of Pliny's uh, Natural uh, History, a project that will lead ultimately to, to, to a full-scale commentary on, on one of Pliny's most uh, uh, demanding and, and exciting uh, books, um, she has uh, spent uh, research periods in, in Oxford and, and uh, Munich, um, and uh, her work has already uh, made uh, quite, a, quite a significant uh, international uh, impact on, on anyone really who um, is interested in the uh, well, cultural history really of, 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 the Roman, of the Roman Empire, not just of the, of the Greek East in Roman uh, context. We are, we are delighted to have her with us uh, today. Um, her paper, as you as you can see from the bilingual uh, slide, uh, will be on Plutarch, Pausanias, and a statue of Athena at Delphi. Art, history, with a comma between art and history, and reception of a of a famous votive offering. Eva, thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> so, bon dia, and first of all, I would like to uh, thank. Claudia and Federico for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here with you in this very beautiful city and I'm sorry for not speaking in Portuguese uh, but please ask question uh, also in Portuguese and I can understand a little bit but Claudia can help me. Um, in this presentation I would like to discuss a very famous votive of votive offering at Delphi and its reception in the Imperial Age. So I, I will not speak uh, about religion indeed, but rather about other values uh, that uh, statues of gods uh, could have uh, in, uh, in a sanctuary. The starting point is Plutarch, oh, this is, oh, okay, it's Plutarch the Pithyraculis. This work is a description of a walk al along the sacred way in Delphi, took by a group of well-educated people and intellectuals on occasion of the visit at Delphi of a foreign visitor, Diogenianus. During the visit, the group is accompanied by some experts of the sanctuary who tell the visitors stories on devotive offerings. The walk begins at the main gate of the sanctuary and bends in front of the temple. And along the way, the group stops at different monuments. The red numbers on the map are the stops. So they uh, begin here and they go along the, the, the road, the sacred way to the temple. During the walk, the visitors listen to the experts' tales. They also discuss about philosophical and re religious matters strictly, st strictly linked to the sanctuary and the offerings they meet along the way. 
Both from a topographical and a metaphorical point of view, the walk along the sacred way is an ascent to the temple of Apollo and to the art of the discussion, which is the responses of the Pitya and the way they changed through time. All the issues discussed along the way are a preparation to the, that main discussion. In this way, the theological and philosophical aspect becomes a way of interpreting the offerings in the sanctuary. I would like to draw your attention to the moment when the group of visitors arrives at the statues of Iro I of Syracuse. The foreign visitor Diogenianus, by reason of his genial nature and good temper, made himself listen to the various tales, although he knew them, them all perfectly well. But when the group was opposite to the statues of Hiero, a tale drew Diogenianus' attention. I read Babbitt's translation. A bronze pillar of Iros standing above had, fa had fallen and it's of, its of, it of itself sorry, during that day on, on which it happened that Hiro was coming to his end at Syracuse. After these words, Philinus recall other similar extraordinary events happened at Delphi. So, the eyes of the bronze statues of Hiero the Spartan fell out before his death in Leuctra. In the same occasion, the gold stars disappeared which Lysander had dedicated after the naval battle at Igospotami in order to remember the help that the two brothers gave to the Spartan army. And then, the, the stone statues of Lysander himself broke out into such a growth of weeds and grass that the face was hidden. Finally, the Eurymedon palm tree was damaged by ravens at the time of the Sicilian expedition, while the crown stolen from Delphi by Philomelus uh, the tyrant uh, caused the death of the dancer Pharsalia when she wore it. Philinus concludes that devotive offerings at Delphi have movement and significance in sympathy with the gods for knowledge and no part of them is void or insensible but all are filled uh, with the divine spirit. Bothos replies by opposing an Epicurean interpreti interpretation of these events, so that a discussion on this matter begins and uh, accompanies the group along the way until the rock of the Sibyl. As you can see, the core of discussion is a very important and debated theme in ancient philosophy, divination, and more precisely, the value and meaning of portents and votive offerings. To Philanus and Bothus, and Bothus, Plutarch opposes the Stoic point of view to the Epicurean interpretation in order to point out exaggeration in both these philosophies. Moreover, an important aspect of the the Pizzola Oraculis in the, study of, in the study of ancient statues emerges in this passage. Plutarch constant, const, constantly interlaces his deep acquaintance with the sanctuary of Delphi where he was priest and the autopsy of devotive offerings with his philosophical and historical knowledge. This makes him a precious witness on the state of the sanctuary in the imperial age, as well as of the reception of devotive offerings in that time. Plutarch's sources on the portents are unknown. Uh, are unknown. Those connected to the battle of Leuctra 
in particular the grass on Lysander statues and, uh, and the disappearing of the, the Oscurai stars are reported also by Cicero in the, the, in the Divinazione. Cicero's source on the, le, uh, on the Lutra portents is Callisthenes. As he declares twice, but he's uh, uh, here on, in the second book of, uh, on divination. But his account is different from that of Plutarch. In fact, um, about the Lysander statues, Plutarch says that weeds and grass cover the face of Lysander statues, Exentesen, uh, Agrian Lochmen, Caipoan, Tusauten Ton Plotus, Oste, Catacrypsae to Prosopon. While Cicero says that a crown of weeds grew on the head of the statues, in capite corona subito extitit, Exasperi serbis et agrestibus. So that it is difficult to say uh, which is Plutarch's uh, relation with Callisthenes. We could suppose that these are two different summaries of Callisthenes' account and try to put them together. The weights grew in the form of a crown and hung down to cover the face, for example. But th this is obviously just a hypothesis. Anyway, this is what we can see, mm, what we can say about Plutarch's sources of importance at the moment. The focus of, of my presentation today is the Eurymedon palm tree, damaged by ravens at the time of the Sicilian expedition. And I read Babbitt's translation. At the time of the Athenian misfortune in Sicily, the golden dates were dropping from the palm tree and ravens were pecking off the edge of the shield of Pallas Athena. In Greek, and that toy sikelikois ton Athenaion tukemazin, aite krusai tu foinikos aperion balanoi, kai tenas aspida tu palladiu korakes peri ecopton. This monument was dedicated on the terrace of the temple by the Athenians after their victory at the uh, Eurymedon around 469-466 BC. So we are here on the map, this is the terrace of the temple, the, um, the palm tree was here um, in front of the Prusias pillar and here. According to literary sources, the palm tree was made of bronze with golden dates. On the palm tree there was a gilt statue of Athena. I don't know if you can see really well the colors, but I, I hope. So uh, there was a, a gilt statue of Athena in the scheme of uh, the Palladium that is with a spear and a shield in its hands. There were also some holes. It is this statues and this fortune that I'd like to discuss with you. The palm tree was linked to Ap Apollo's birthplace, Delos but the choice of this offering by the Athenians had also political meaning. It was in fact an allusion to the Delian League and the Athena on the top showed that Athens led the, the League. In the life of Nietzsche, Plutarch described this offering as a dedication from the best deeds against Persians. And this makes clear that also in the imperial age the political meaning of the offering was preeminent. 
I would like to draw your attention on what the ravens do to this offering in occasion of the Sicilian expedition. So, tena spida tu paladio coraces periecopton. They damage the statues of Athena, which represents the city, depriving it of its defense weapon and forewarning the imminent defeat of Athens. The metaphorical meaning of this event is obvious, but what really happened to the statues in 415 BC? The problem is the meaning of the verb pericoptum. Translations usually refer to a damage b made by crows with their beaks, that is, pecking. According to Babbitt, for example, they were pecking off the edge of the shield of Pallas Athena. But if we have a look at the verb on the little Scott Jones, we realize that pericopto does not imply a precise reference to beaks and pecking, as Babbitt and other translators say. On the contrary, the verb means cut all around, mutilate, and it is used, for example, for the mutilation of arms, or in Plutarch for statues which are not Finnish but rough yin. Moreover, Plutarch often uses pericopto in the meaning of cut off, intercept, that is with the idea of separating something in the accusative from someone in the genitive. It is true that the simple verb copto uh, can be used in uh, the meaning of to pack but the compound verb pericopto is never attested elsewhere with this meaning. In Plutarch, Plutarch's text, peri, eh, periecopton has an accusative, ten aspida, so the shield. Based just on this text and the meanings attested elsewhere for pericopto, we could doubt that Plutarch is referring to an action made with beaks. Maybe, more in general, it could describe a damage, a mutilation of the shield, made with beaks, but, al but also, why not, with talons. Unfortunately, it does not specify the extent of the damage and in accordance with the meaning of the verb it seems that we have two possibilities. The crows could have cut the shield of Athena off or caused damage all around the edge of the shield as Schroeder seems to think. Plutarch described the same episode in the life of Nietzsche with different uh, words. Uh, I read the Greek, tut ekopton ephemeras polas prospetomenoi korakes, kai ton karponon ta kruzun tu foinikos apetrogon kai katebalon. Here Plutarch uses the verb copto and does not mention the shield but just the dates. He also adds that according the Athenians this was an invention of the Delphian. By using copto, Plutarch probably refers to pecking, which is a meaning attested for the verb. Therefore, we could easily conclude, as translators usually, usually do, that also in the De, Pizzi Oraculis, pericopto means to peck, and that Plutarch uses it in a peculiar meaning, never attested elsewhere. However, there is a passage in Posanias Periegesis which could add some, some details to this picture. I read John's translation. 
The bronze palm tree, as well as a gilt image of Athena on it, was dedicated by the Athenians from the spoils they took in their two successes on the same day at the Eurymaton on one hand and the other with their fleet uh, on the river. The gold on this image was, I noticed, damaged in parts. I myself put the blame on rogues and thieves, but Clytodemus, the oldest writer to describe the customs of the Athenians, says in his account of Attica that when the Athenians were preparing the Sicilian expedition, a vast flock of crowns swooped on Delphi, packed this image over and with their beaks tore away its gold. He says that the crowds also broke off the spear, the holes and the imitation fruit on the palm tree. Posanias describes the offering so a bronze palm tree with a gilt statues on a tea of Athena on it and that's that when he visited the sanctuary of Delphi he noticed that the gold on this image was damaged in part. At first he put the blame on rogues and thieves and then he read in Clythodemus the right reason. When the Athenians were preparing the Sicilian expedition, a vast flock of crows swooped on Delphi, packed this image over and with their beaks tore away its gold. Um, and he says that the crows also broke off the spear, the holes and the imitation fruit on, on the palm tree. Also Posanias, quoting Clytodemus, uses the verb pericopto to describe the raven's action. Pericopton te tu agalmatos tuto. This second occurrence of pericopto in reference to the same events, event sounds like a very peculiar coincidence. The meaning of the verb in Posanias' text is not clear. As the comparison of this translation reveal, in the English translations the verb is connected with an action made with beaks, pecking. Fraser, for example, translates peck this image and Jones packed this image over. However, we saw that this meaning is not attested for the verb. On the contrary, Arias translates attaccarsi alla statua, which is clinging to the statues, obviously with talons. But also this translation appears a free interpretation of Pusanias' word. Clinging to the statues with talons is something plausible to do for a flock uh, of crowns. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you hear me better? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, clinging to the statues with talons is something plausible to do for a flock of crowds which damage a statues, but it is not an attested meaning of the verb pericopto. Rizzo gives the verb a more general meaning without specific reference to talons or and beaks. Devastarono tutto intorno questa statua, that is, damaged all around the statues. This interpretation seems closer to the meanings attested for the verb, but we have to admit that it does not give a great sense if the action is against a statue, not against a, seal, a shield like in Plutarch. Posenius' text presents indeed a problem. The construction of peri, uh, periecopton is with the genitive to agalmatos tuto, 
but this verb is usually used with the accusative of the object which is mutilated. In other words, we would expect to read periecopton teto agalma, just like Demosthenes says to Hermas periecopten. Reflecting on this, and also in Plutarch we have the accusative, tenaspida. Reflecting on this, I was wondering if there is a mistake in Posania's text. A hint, a, a hint in this direction could also be given by the presence of te after periecopton. In fact, if we consider the text transmitted by the manuscript, this te could be interpreted only in correlation with the following chi, this one. So, a vast flock of crows swooped on Delphi and this chi, not only te, Periecopton tu agalmatos tuto, but also the second Kai, with their beaks tore away its gold. In other words, the crowds made two actions against the statue, and the second one was tear tearing away its gold with their beaks. But which is the first one? If pericopton means, as John say, to pack the statues, the correlation tekai sounds a little bit odd because we would have twice a reference to the same action, packing the golden statue. In Arya's translation, the correlation Tekai makes a better sense because we have an action made with talons clinging to the statues and one made with bits, stretching the gold with bits. But we already have seen that this interpretation of Pericopto is free. Is free. I think that the right way to read this text is comparing it with Plutarch's account. Two imperial authors tell us the same extraordinary event happened in Delphi in 415 BC on occasion of a very important historical event for Athens, the Sicilian expedition. They both use a very peculiar verb to describe the action of ravens, and in both cases the text is not clear. It could be a coincidence or a hint of a connection between these two passages. In this perspective, a detail in Posanias' account appears very precious. He mentioned a precise source for this news, Clytodemus, the most ancient writer on Athenian history. Therefore, I wonder whether this use of Pericopto comes both Plutarch and Posanias from Clytodemus. In the life of Nietzsche, Plutarch says that according to the Athenians, the, this was an invention of the Delphian. The Raven story was an invention of the Delphian. But this is not exclude ob obviously the hypothesis of, uh, um, uh, of his depending on uh, uh, Clytodemus. If Plutarch depends on the same source used by Posanias, that is Clytodemus, we would have a further reason to believe that Plutarch's text could give us some help in restoring the text of the Periegasis. Maybe if we add ten aspida in Posanias' account, we restore a better meaning and grammar and give the right importance to the correlation tekai which in this case would indicate a correlation of two different damages occurred to the statues of Athena, one to the shield and the other to the gilding. 
At this point, toys ramphysin could also refer to both actions and confirm that the verb pericopto alone does not imply packing but indicates a mutilation, a damage the statues suffered. This would be the final interpretation of the text. A vast flock of crows swooped on Delphi and with their beaks not only cut the shield of uh, the statues off or cause damage all around the edge of the shield of the statues, but also tore away its uh, uh, gold. It remains the problem of deciding whether the shield was cut off from the statues or simply damaged at the edges. Obviously, a different interpretation of the text impacts our reconstru reconstruction of the Eurymedon palm tree fortune and its state of conservation in the imperial age. Obviously, the story of the ravens could be just an, invention, an invention, but when Pausanias in the second century AD arrives at the sanctuary of Delphi and sees on the terrace of the temple the famous Eurymedon palm tree and the At Athena statues on it, he observes that the, the gold on this image was damaged in parts. It's the omen, so he saw that. In a way that is uh, compatible with the action of thieves. Based on this description, it seems that in the second century AD, the gilding of the statues was scratched. In other words, according to manuscripts, Pausanias testifies just the damaging of the gilding of Athena and his quotation of Clytodemus as reported in the manuscripts which refers to the gilding oh, sorry. Um, agrees with Pausanias' uh, autopsy of the statues. On the contrary, we learn about the damages occurred uh, to Athena's shield only from Plutarch. While Plutarch and Clytodemus agree in testifying the dropping of dates, finally just Clytodemus refers to the breaking off of the spear and the holes. But if we correct Posanias text adding Tenaspida, Clytodemus would refer both to the shield like in Plutarch and to the gilding of Athena. The text would remain coherent with what Pausanias wants to demonstrate by quoting Clytodemus, that is the real reason of the scratching of Athena's gilding. However, we would learn a detail that Pausanias seems not to have noticed by autopsy, that is, the damaging or cutting off of Athena's shield. If it was simply damaged, it is possible that Pausanias figured it out just a damage in the gilding. But obviously, it is also possible that he simply omits the detail of the lack of the shield. In fact, when he thinks of the thieves, it is possible that it allu alludes at lacking parts of the statues, like the shield. Moreover, he seems not to have noticed the other breaking offs reported by Clytodemus. Uh, that is, the spear, the dates, and the holes. The third possibility is that at Pausanias' time, the statues was restored and its attributes, shield, spear, dates, and holes, which uh, were fallen down, again added. So, I try to resume. 
Through the comparison of Plutarch's and Posanias' description of the Eurymedon palm tree and the related portent, we can probably add a new source to Plutarch's chapter on portents in Delphi, Clytodemus, and restore a better text in Posanias' account. Mm, pericopto ap appears to be the verb already used uh, by Clytodemus. In the life of Nietzsche, Plutarch seems not to quote literary, literary source, but, uh, but from memory, uh, so that he uses copto and does not refer to the and does not refer to the shield. The interpretation of pericopto in the the Pizze Oraculis as to peck has surely be, in, been influenced by in the life of Nietzsche, but we should be careful about that because copto appears to be a quotation from memory and Plutarch's interpretation of Clytodemus text. In other words, it is not obvious that it is correct. Plutarch was uh, certainly a great intellectual of his time, but more than once he makes mistakes when he quotes. In uh, this case, it should not be a real mistake, but just a kind of not detailed paraphrases of Clytodemus text. Obviously, the ravens uh, use their beaks to damage the statues, but this does not mean that by using pericopto, Clytodemus intended to say just pecking. And I think that the uh, issues whether he wrote that the shield was cut off from the statues or simply damaged at the edges remains open. Maybe, considering that in Posanias' quotation of Clytodemus, the list of the breaking offs is at the end of the account, in a separate section from that, from that on the shield, we could guess that the shield was just damaged at the edges. So, thank you very much for your attention. Questions and comments? Yash. Um, you could expect to um, have a, um, as it were, oracular implication. Mm -hmm. So the shield, in a way, belongs, the idea of Athens losing the shield yeah. belongs with a kind of contarchic um, exegesis. Yeah. I wonder if you look at the Pausania, could we not assume that Tom Crusoe at the end of the um, sentence refers is the object of the verbs in both the Teh and the Kai also? So it's the goal that's been uh, mm -hmm. we have two ways of taking off the goal, which uh, would be Peria Cocton and Athet Press. Um, so that would tie with the Okay. That their goal has been lost. And he has put the, 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 the goal emphatically at the end of the tour. Then he wouldn't need to restore the use of the attack aspect. Yeah, but well, the problem is that in this way, the, well, he says uh, always the same thing. I mean, twice. So in other words, his concern okay. would be more material, um, more, which is, would, would go with Pausanias, who's concerned with material uh, qualities. Okay. And also, um, uh, the other thing I'm, I'm very skeptical would be that Pausanias would, n would fail to notice a missing shield or spear. Well, he tells you about the spear, but he doesn't say it's missing. So it must have been put back by the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think you're right about yeah. that. What's odd, it hasn't been regilded. It's not so expensive to regild yeah, yeah. it. 
he know he know I mean systematically he notices. Mm -hmm. So I I'm, I'm not saying you're certainly wrong but I'm just simply uh, suggesting there's a reason that Plutarch would want the shield would want to push the oracular yeah, implications yeah. and that's not a reason Pausanias would have. Mm -hmm. uh, just Yeah but what I find strange anyway is the the use of this uh, verb uh, peri pericopto I and would agree with you yeah, that it Yeah that's the point yeah. and uh, Although Pausanias gives you these toys scram fessin so it gives he helps you Yeah how it would work I don't know well I I found this this solution uh, more easier than uh, than thinking uh yeah but uh, mm, don't know well because the the verb is is uh, is strange and well it's a repeat uh, it's a repetition of two two actions so but like I two different ways of damaging that then it, they, that would be have to be the explanation but in the end it would be the same it's not so different because it's uh, well, yeah emphatic they just yeah very emphatic i mean uh, because uh, yeah because he would say that uh, he uh he damaged the the gold of the statues and with big uh, uh tear the gold yeah tour away the gold so i don't know well uh i understand that um, mm, in a plutarch uh, plutarch's perspective obviously uh well he chose the shield because uh, it was uh, the the symbol of Athens and of the, the imminent uh, Athens uh, defeat in uh, uh, in Sicily, uh, and so uh, among all these uh, damages, uh, he chose uh, uh, that one for a precise uh, uh, reason. But uh, I don't think that uh, he invented it. So that's why I thought that this uh, reference to the shield uh, must be in uh, Clytodemus. Uh, well the, the one problem is that both these authors have autopsy in Delphi. Yeah. In fact, Plutarch knows Delphi better than Clytodemus yeah, or sure. anybody. <laughs> and um, both have the um, support of um, guides and all this kind of, all the yeah. hearsay in the folklore. So um, it's awkward to be dependent on a single source. Uh, uh, earlier source that's missing to us now mm. there is other information and the information is also capable of uh, what should we say generating more mythology yeah but i over think the that uh, this is a very important uh, uh, source for uh, for them and for these uh, events because uh, well also the way plutarch uh, quoted it and i mean uh, introduce uh, him as the oldest uh, uh, writer uh, on the history of uh, Athens, so it's a kind of of respect. I mean, uh, uh, so I think that uh, it was a, an important uh, uh, sources for uh, for, uh, for both of them. And uh, yeah, I know obviously uh, Plutarch. Uh, knew the archives in Delphi where all these uh, stories about the um, the century uh, were preserved and transmitted uh, but anyway I think that the reference to the uh, most uh, important uh, historical writer of Athens is not uh, well it, it's um, as is meaning because Plutarch is also an um, uh, an historian. I mean, and so it's also his way to put together uh, uh, his philosophical and historical knowledge uh, with uh, uh, the religious uh, landscape uh, of uh, of Delphi. 
could I could I ask uh, yeah. uh, about Pericopter? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, how how out of the ordinary is that is that verb? Uh, how how uh, frequently does it occur in the historiographical <laughs> genre, for example? Okay, uh, well. It's quite attested, mm -hmm. but uh, um, every time uh, with this uh, meaning of uh, cut off, separate yep. something from something uh, else. Uh, and the range uh, is uh, quite wide. Mm -hmm. mm, it can be used uh, uh, for objects, uh, but also in situation. For example, uh, it's quite attested in, uh, in Plutarch. But uh, always, uh, in general, uh, except for that passage uh, on the statues uh, we, uh, which are not finished, uh, it is in general used to uh, describe situation where, for example, uh, uh, in a battle, a group of people, of soldiers, are cut off from, uh, from the... Yeah, the army, or for yeah. example, when someone is isolated um, from uh, the, uh, I, I don't have the English word for that, for that uh, dei fornimenti. Supplies. Supplies, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, in general, he uses it, it uh, in historical situation, yeah. I mean, and then there is this passage on the uh, unfinished uh, statues. Yeah. And then we have this, uh, this passage on the Athena statues. Yeah. I mean, I've got another question, but again, it's, it's a deeply ignorant one. I, I was struck by the reference to the deterioration of the, of the gold, which is ascribed either to the uh, ravens or possibly to thieves. Right. Yeah. I mean, how would that work? I mean, are, are, we, are we thinking about thieves sort of discreetly approaching the statue and scratching yeah. off some gold and putting it in a in a yeah? And wha when uh, uh, well, how uh, would that work? <laughs> and, and how at, how well attested, if at all, is, is that? Honestly, I ask uh, some uh, mm. Mm, some. Um, Restauratori, uh, um, some, res some restoration, restori yes. uh, yeah, some restoration Restore. aspect, yeah, and they um, they uh, answered that uh, well, it could be more difficult or easier. It de it depended on uh, the way the gold was uh, uh, put on uh, the bronze, and so right. in uh, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the first time I thought, well, it, it couldn't be so uh, so easy, but in the end it seems, because they could be uh, just uh, uh, plucked leaves, yeah. gold leaves, uh, for right. example, uh, or, yeah. yeah. Well, it's not a negligible amount of gold. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, and depended also on the, mm, the lo, lo spessore. On Thickness. The, the, yeah, of the gold. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so they they said, but no, no. Well, I can, I can imagine. But, yeah. but if it's gold leaf, it's negligible. Oh well, then it's nothing. But oh. then it's not relevant because Pausanias wants to make a big story about the depredation of the statue. So actually, yeah, that's true. It doesn't matter if. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more. Mythology. Yeah, obviously, in that case, uh, it's not. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not obvious that he is right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, the meaning of copter means memory instead of blocking. I don't know. If mm, no, <laughs> my idea was that uh, uh, when uh, mm, Plutarch uh, quotes uh, uh, again uh, uh, this, uh, well, describes again uh, this uh, portent uh, in uh, the life of Nietzsche, he uh, just. Uh, uh, quotes from memory, so he doesn't uh, okay. use the the, mm, the the words uh, used in uh, his uh, source. I mean, so that's why he uses copto and uh, uh, well, it's a kind of paraphrase in that case of the passage uh, he had in mind. Oh, so so I thought. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault. I was not uh, so clear. I thought that maybe for that the the symbolic thing of the crows, the, the ravens in, in the statue maybe means something like 
destroy the the memory from that. Ah, you know. mm, 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 no, no, no. Okay, but okay. <laughs> very quickly, I mean, at some point you did uh, uh, at least contemplate in theory the possibility of a restoration of of the statue, didn't you? Yeah. How, how frequent would that be? Well, it could be very frequent. Very. We, yeah, obviously, just well, we we know about very important uh, artworks uh, of, uh, and. Uh, statues and mm -hmm. uh, statues of gods. Uh, uh, well, I don't know, for example, I have in mind uh, we have a decree from uh, the uh, time of uh, Lycurgus where uh, uh, it's attested a restoration uh, of uh, the um, Athena Nike statues uh, in uh, the temple of Athena Nike. Uh, on the Acropolis of uh, of Athens, and uh, well, there is a discussion about that, uh, wi which statues uh, it was, because uh, we know about an archaic statues, and di di but this one uh, was the statues uh, ded dedicated in uh, 425, uh, and so well, there is a discussion if uh, it was a second cult uh, statues of Athena uh, Nike or just uh, another yeah. a, a statues of Athena Nike and uh, for example there the discussion uh, some uh, scholars think that uh, just a cult statues so a, a cult statue so a very important statue could be restored but in this case uh, it, it was a very important yes. uh, offering voting offering in Delphi and uh, yeah, so it, it could be that uh, it was uh, uh, restored. Yes. Uh, when you opened, you showed us, um, in a way, almost a periagesis of yeah. Delphi um, through stops at various uh, monuments by Plutarch. Yeah. And I wondered if anyone has uh, compared this. Yes, all your red, uh, red, yeah. red on the uh, uh, map. <sighs> And I wonder if anyone has compared this with um, Pausanias's route through Delphi. I did. And, and that's in, is that in your? Um in, in no, uh, it's n it's not in my thesis, and but uh, I studied it for uh, um, for a seminar at uh, the Scuola Normale, and uh, I did the comparison, and I think that uh, there are a lot of uh, similarities, and it is worth. Uh, compare uh, them uh, um, yeah and is this th something you'll publish because uh, it's also interesting um, c uh, Pausanias in Olympia does uh, mm -hmm. quite complex yeah tour. it's and more complex than here yes because there he selects uh, Pausanias selects yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the, the the offerings uh, uh, by typology so he goes uh, first through the uh, representation of uh, uh, human beings and then uh, the representation of gods of gods uh, so he he go through he several times yes yeah, so he goes a lot of times uh, uh, all around the century while here in delphi he just begin at the entrance and go up uh, to the theater and uh, yeah but uh, i think the that uh, there are uh, some similarities uh, and obviously, uh, Plutarch uh, just choose, uh, um, chooses the, the monuments uh, he, he is interested in for his discussion because uh, uh, mainly he is, uh, well, his interest, his focus uh, is uh, philosophical. But uh, mm, Every which is interest uh, is that uh, he connects uh, uh, every uh, philosophical and historical theme to a precise, uh, um, a precise uh, votive offerings, and sometimes it's interesting to see which one uh, he chose. Uh, he, he well, for example. Um, I wrote about this. At the entrance, the first discussion uh, is uh, on the uh, patina of the, uh, of the bronzes in Delphi, which is uh, um, more bluish. Uh, uh, 
and uh, so the visitor are uh, astonished uh, in front of this uh, peculiar uh, color of the bronze and uh, they discuss about it but at the entrance of, uh, of the sanctuary uh, Plutarch could choose different uh, votive offerings uh, which were prop proper I mean um, uh, and uh, for this kind of uh, discussion and uh, it chose uh, the uh, admiral monuments uh, which were very impressive and not for example uh, um, the, the monument of Marathon or, uh, or others which are, were any, any way uh, important so uh, in that case uh, I think that uh, um, uh, he he chose that one because of the historical meaning of uh, mm, of that monument. Uh, the monument of uh, the admirals were, uh, was dedicated by the Spartans after the um, the battle of uh, Egospotamai. So it was uh, uh, the, a, a naval victory, and uh, Plutarch uh, interprets uh, the color of these uh, statues, this blue, uh, in connection with the sea and with this uh, uh, naval event. So this is the kind of game in some way he, uh, he creates in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this work. But uh, yeah, Pausanias' point of view is completely different. It's more, it's like, uh, well, mm, it's more uh, uh, literary in some way. And uh, he uh, looked through all, through the inscription uh, uh, and uh, gives all the details on the history and the myths. Uh, linked to devotive offerings uh, uh, and it's more like uh, a guide in some way or, uh, but uh, the contrast, the comparison uh, is, uh, is very interesting I think and in some way what Pausanias uh, uh, does is uh, perfectly what uh, Plutarch uh, doesn't want to do when, because it's uh, he, he is very ironic at the beginning of the, um, the PTA Oraculis when he says that this uh, Roman visitor, Diogenianus, knows everything about uh, the, the century and he is a little bit bored. Uh, when these uh, experts uh, speak so because they read all the description and they describe uh, all the monuments uh, and tell uh, uh, them uh, all the history the, uh, about the, uh, the monuments but he knows all of that and this is perfectly precisely what Pausanias, Pausanias uh, do so yeah there is uh, in Plutarch, I think there is also a little bit, uh, a little um, criticism against this uh, way of visiting this sanctuary because yes, there are uh, a lot of uh, um, artworks, very famous all over the world, but uh, he constantly reminds us that they are not just artworks. And so they belong to the century and to Apollo. So thank you to you, really. <laughs>